What is anarchism? <laughs> This is probably your interpretation. Truth is, it's not. If you picked up a copy of Webster, you probably think it's this. To be without rulers. Truth is, it's not. Anarchism is a formal, deeply long-rooted political thought, but what it basically comes down to is the abolition of all unjustified hierarchy. The roots of this tree go back a long, long time, as far back in some people's minds as primitive society. Some say the Greeks had anarchism, some say the Chinese had anarchism, but to make things simple, we're just going to be speeding right ahead to here. It's the French Revolution, and people are pissed off, and it's the auditorium's kicking ass. But this video isn't about him, because he doesn't exist. This situation, however, was where anarchism in the modern, established form finally began. A lot of people during this era were thinking about stuff like, why are the poor poor and the rich rich? And what's with this new bourgeois class that's coming about? Some of these people were really influential and interesting, I suggest you check them out. Some were really influential, but weren't that interesting. And some are just spooks. <laughs> but there was this one guy, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who looked like the illegitimate love child of Brian Blessed and Chris Hedges. And he's an anti-hierarchist, but that's too many syllables, so he mixes around the letters, goes up to his imaginary friend and says, I am an anarchist! And that was really edgy at the time, because until this point, anarchy has always been known as hey. Anyway, in what is property, he gives the outline of private property. That's capitalism, the form around which private property rests, and the state from which property is sustained. And he doesn't like this, and says that property is theft, by which he meant some property. And that makes everybody really pissed off. Except for Karl Marx, two of them get along really well, and then they don't. But Marx is still cool. Anarchists view private property as bad because the owner gets far more of his fair share of control over everything. Like owning an entire factory he barely uses, or owning an entire state of land that he never touches. Except for prancing around on a pony. But everyone else needs certain things to survive. NEEDS! But they don't own a forest, or a lake, or a farm full of pigs. So they need to work for the owners in order to buy those things, and pay the landlords in order to live on the land. They could own all these things together, but nah. Pierre's anarchism advocated something minor by today's comparison of it. Mutually owned property. That means that the workers own the factories, and the community owns the houses, and they still get to sell and distribute stuff to each other in a market. This is also known as mutualism. Which most anarchists don't adhere to today, but most consider it pretty cool. Enter Mikhail Bakunin, who basically is Brian Blessed. And he's also an anarchist, but he doesn't like mutualism that much, so he starts up his own school. Collectivism! Which is basically a system of money without accumulation, so nobody can get as rich as Bill Gates. Michael goes to Lyon and tries to uprise it, but he fails. But later some hipster guys copied his ideas and led a successful uprising in Paris during the Franco-Prussian War. And for about two months everything was pretty darn cool. And the bloody week happened. Oh boy. Bakunin lays down the groundwork for syndicalism, and in the 70s, he along with other theorists with similar views, established anarchism as a trademark name during the first International Working Men's Association. And then Marx kicks them out. But Marx is still cool. For a few years everything goes fairly quiet, but then another white guy comes along, Peter Kropotkin, and he looked at Mikhail's ideology and thought, you what mate? Well-being for all. And he wants to popularise another school of thought. In other words, he wants to create a society that Marx envisioned, but using anarchist tactics. And he writes plenty of books, has a bit of a fetish for science, and he also supported the French during World War I, but let's not get too much into that. At this time, it's the golden age of the American labour movement, and you've suddenly got even more guys kicking the state's ass. And they're demanding eight-hour days, welfare benefits, retirement, programs, minimum wage. And suddenly eight of them get caught and hanged, and later people go on to call this day May Day. Enter Emma Goldman, and she's pretty damn cool, and she helps rally the masses, and doesn't really like the suffragettes that much. Hashtag not Lanarchus. It's 1917 now, and America enters World War One despite saying they wouldn't, and Emma screams, don't sign up, resulting in her imprisonment for two years in exile to her native Russia. And thus we enter the era of revolution in Europe. Yes, everybody's having revolutions to one extent or another. Oh, did we mention the Russia's having one too? Well, at that time, the Bolsheviks are taking power. But over in Ukraine, there was a young peasant boy called Mr. Magno, who wore a really funny hat. Well, he helped band together a group of peasants under platformism, made a really cool flag, and led the army to defend an area that became known as the Free Territory of Ukraine, with the help of a really cool machine gun carriage. And together, the Black Army destroys the White Army with a little bit of help from the Red Army. All was well for a few days after that, but then let in some sound 300,000 troops and the Black Army is destroyed. Magno flees to Romania, then France, then dies. Back in America, Lucia Parsons continues to kick some ass and scare some police officers. The boss and the big boss get executed, and no Ito gets strangled in her sleep. Oh my! Speaking of Japan... Japan had occupied Korea for quite some time, but did you also know that the Korean anarchists fought back and made their own little Shin Min autonomous zone to combat imperialism? Well, they did! And... 
Well, sadly, not much is known about these guys due to the lack of diaspora, untranslated documents, and brutal repression. So, sorry. But get ready, guys, because this is the big one. Fascism is spreading all across Europe, except for Spain. Spain's becoming pretty damn progressive at last. But some people didn't like that, especially this one guy called Franco, and he creates a coup and begins the Spanish Civil War. But wait! Remember this guy? Well, it turns out he taught his ideas to Giuseppe Benelli, and he went on a nice little holiday in Spain. And for about 60 years, the Basque regions, Aragon, and Catalonia start building up a radical set of syndicalist unions. The biggest being this one. They seized control of Barcelona and created a workers' paradise of sorts. And healthcare improved. Living standards improved. Production improves. Literacy improves. Alcoholism goes down. And hundreds of people flocked to Catalonia to help and support, including Emma Goldman and George Orwell, who later went on to write Animal Farm in 1980. Wait a minute. George Orwell was a socialist? So it looks well for Spain, right? Wrong. Some fascist guys you may have heard of fun Franco and eventually kills them all. Well, most of them. And thus ends the era of revolution in Europe. So, for a long time, anarchism goes pretty darn quiet, and World War II re-energizes national pride in the victorious nations, not to mention all the free stuff they're getting. A few theorists do make a prominence still, like Chomsky the Mild and Bookchin the Eccentric. Punk makes its mark, and hipster anarchism begins. There are still some social democratic worker movements, but they all get crushed by the neoliberal reforms of the 1980s. But it's not all doom and gloom. In Germany, the squatter movement founds the famous Black Bloc tactic, and <laughs> What's this? Another revolution? Yes, finally the Mexicans are getting one too. Welcome to Chipas, Mexico. Things are pretty bad in Chipas, with poverty really widespread. But for a while, a small group of anarchists who follow neo-Zapatism want some more freedom. They name themselves the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, named after this guy. And together they lead a semi-revolution and are able to fend for themselves. After two weeks of fighting, the authorities say fuck you, and a ceasefire is declared. They've also got this really sick looking guy with a pipe. Sadly, a year later, the army said, actually, fuck you, and chased them up into the mountains where they remain today. Together, they now help provide coffee for anarchists across the world. Yeah! Finally, if you haven't noticed, shit's kicking off in the Middle East. And of the many groups in Syria, one of them is called the PKK, a Marxist Leninist institution led by this guy called Auckland. The CIA doesn't like Auckland, and in 1999, they have him captured and sent to a little island by the sea. But he reads book to him while he's there, and he thinks he's got style. So he, uh, hierarchically tell the rest of the PKK to go anarchismo? Yeah, the situation's pretty hazy. But nonetheless, they all agree and with a bunch of other ideologies, they fend off Islamic State and design a new confederalized autonomous society nowadays known simply as Rojava. And a bunch of peeps hit the web and make YouTube videos explaining anarchism over and over and over. And there's a load of stuff more that I didn't mention, but we'll leave it there. The end! <laughs> Hello everyone, hope you enjoyed the video. I intend on making more like these in the future, so if you like that kind of stuff, then hit the subscribe button for more. I'm also on Twitter at badmouse101, and if you want to ask me a question, then please do so on Ask FM. That's all for today, folks, so thank you for watching, and bye for now.